Friday Forum. I am Lisa Collins, a member of City Club's Forum Committee. For more than a century, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people work together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live and explore. We gather today at the Sentinel, Sentinel Hotel and are joined by thousands of Oregonians via X-Ray FM's radio stations, KGW's website, Facebook feed and news app, and Open Signals community media television stations. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our sponsors enable us to continue to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Thank you to the Portland Business Alliance for your generous support of the State of the City events this week. Everyone, please join me in showing our appreciation to our sponsors, staff, and volunteers who have made this event possible. Today I'm pleased to welcome Mayor Ted Wheeler and Rakaya Adams in part two of our special two-part State of the City. Mayor Wheeler is no doubt familiar to you all. As a former Monoma County Chair, Oregon State Treasurer, and Lincoln High School Senior Class President, he has a, <laughs> he has a long history of public service in our region. Rakaya Adams also has a long history of service in Portland. She learned to read at King School, learned to communicate at Harriet Tubman Middle School, and became an academic scholar at Caitlin Gable. Now, as the Chief Investment Officer at Meyer Tr Memorial Trust, she's responsible for all investment activities and the long-term financial strength of the organization. She is also the chair of the Oregon Investment Council, the board that manages approximately $90 billion for the state of Oregon and PERS. I know Rakaya has a lot of questions for the mayor, so let's get started. Please join me in welcoming them both. Senior class president, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I was a little surprised to see that pop up in the list of community service, but um, yeah, you know, that was really... Uh, Do you remember what your platform was? I, I, like, vote I, for Tay? I really don't, to be honest <laughs> with you. I'm not sure I even had a platform. Uh, there is a funny story there, though, and I, I, since I think I have an hour with you, I might as well tell it. Um, so Portland is very lucky, in fact, the entire region is very lucky that Dr. David Bangsberg has just been selected and has served for several months in his capacity as the first ever joint dean of the School of Public Health of Portland State University and OHSU. And uh, I don't mind telling you, I am an unabashed fan of Dr. Bangsberg. He's a rock star. We're lucky to have recruited him back to Portland. But I like to remind him when I see him that he's the guy I beat in that race for class president. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave, wherever you are today, uh, a, a little walk down memory lane, but it's not my fault. It was the city club that brought it up. Well, I, <laughs> I like that will be the spirit of our discussion today. Today, and we'll have some other reminders today. Before we jump in, I want to thank you for being here and having this conversation about the state of the city. I'd like to thank the city club for providing a framework for a conversation about the city, not just your speech, but some space for us to bat it around a bit. I want to thank the audience, both in the room and those folks listening to the broadcast for engaging with the issues in the city and spending your time thinking about how we can take better care of each other. So this is the second part um, uh, of the mayor's report on the state of the city, and it's an unusual approach. So I want to make a few points clear about the format. Um, we're here to talk about the mayor's agenda and his opinion about the state of the city. Uh, we'll start with the questions are formed on his State of the City speech from yesterday and the agenda that he laid out. I will not ask questions about topics that he did not raise, but I will ask follow-up questions about issues, themes, and conclusions that were surfaced in his uh, speech. I hope that audience members during the Q&A will ask questions about things that he didn't touch on, like infrastructure, uh, that will be necessary for our growing city, um, the conversation that we're, ha we're having about interstate highways and their expansion and safety in the central city. 
Uh, those didn't come up yesterday. I hope you, you ask questions about those if, if you'd like. I also will try to focus our conversation on substantive issues. There are lots of times when we use the wrong words, but the substance of the agreement or the spirit of the agreement is in alignment. Today, because our time is so special, I really want to focus on the things where I think there is substantive dissonance and that we'd like to model in this conversation civil discourse on very difficult topics, including policing. In order to take feedback from the audience, and because I'm black, I need some information from you as we have this conversation. In civil right, exactly, in civil activism circles, the way you provide feedback in conversations is to snap. So it, let me hear your snaps. Let's hear some snaps. All right. So I would very much like it if you would provide us feedback by snapping in situations where you feel energy. It could be positive energy. It could be mm, not so positive energy. But it helps us share information, real-time information, as we go along. So there was a statement that Mayor Wheeler said yesterday that I felt a lot of energy around. So I'm going to read that statement and see how you feel about it. He said, housing is a human right. Okay. Is that good or bad, though? I, <laughs> <laughs> There's energy. So this is a, another way for us to take real-time energy. Ted, are you okay with that approach? Works for me. That's great. Okay. So in our conversation today, I'd like to follow up on three specific things that he mentioned in his speech. The first is affordable housing. The second is policing. And the third is the place of children in a progressive city. And I'd like to start with the conversation about children. So in your discussion and in the framework for the presentation was at Portland Community College where we have young people studying, trying to become something effective and engaged citizens. The student who introduced you clearly knew a bit about you and was ambitious and creative and was also a graduate of Lincoln High School. Uh, you have tweeted support of, of Parkland students and student protests around the city in, in, in forcing us to talk about gun, gun control. But at the end of your speech, you mentioned the 30,000 people between the ages of 16 and 24 that you described as idle, meaning that they weren't working and they weren't in school around the city. And what I took away from that was a sort of menacing feeling. Um, no judgment, but that was the feeling that I got from it. And so I thought that we should talk a bit about the place that children have in a progressive city and whether you as mayor think about them in the work that you do um, in addressing some of the challenges around the city. Yeah, thank you. And that was a, a, an excellent lead in and an excellent setup. Uh, first of all, to be clear, when I say that there are 30,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither employed nor engaged with furthering their education, I don't see that as a criticism of those young people, I see it as a failure of ours as adults. Oh look, there's the snapping thing is going, that works. Um, the reality is we're supposed to, and I'm speaking to the adults in the room, we are supposed to set the table for the next generation. My goal in life is to leave the world in a better place than I found it. And that requires a lot of diligence, a lot of maintenance, and a lot of work. And when it comes to employment, young people are not being well served. And I'm not going to make a blank statement. I'm going to be even more specific and say young kids, particularly kids of lower income and kids who are from communities of color, are disproportionately negatively impacted by high levels of youth unemployment. And that is a continuation of a history and a tradition and an institutionally racist society that puts down blocks and barriers. And it starts with access to housing, access to neighborhoods, access to quality education, and support networks, which just aren't in place. So again, this is not a condemnation of young people. This is an effort on my part, perhaps not um, 
put out there as eloquently as I could, Rukaya, but where my heart is here is I want to set the table for people as early in their life as possible. And this Connect to Careers program that we've put into place, I have a, a council of economic advisors and I've got people from large businesses and small businesses who work with me and, and Prosper Portland and Work Systems. And it's a diverse group of people, and we talk about how to best serve this next generation, and the Connect to Careers program is one way that we're connecting these specific youth to the job opportunities that currently exist in an economy that's actually almost at full employment. And so that gap is noticeable, it's real, and we have to be very intentional, intentional in terms of how we address it. Just today, just this morning, there was an opportunity job fair for youth uh, as part of this Connect to Careers program. I'm told there were uh, over 40 employers there, 30 institutions. Uh, it gives kids the opportunity to practice interview skills, to help them build a resume, but most importantly of all, more important than any of that, is its connections to employers who really want to see them succeed in the next part of their life. So the thing that doesn't resonate well with me is that some of the most intractable problems that we have are children's problems. Mm -hmm. The interfaces uh, with policing for young people, the homelessness situation with 4,300 young people facing homelessness or having right. unstable housing, um, our employment issues. and so. I understand there are discrete programs, but how do you as the mayor or how does the city council advocate for children's needs as part of the city, separate from individual policies or programs or educational outcomes, which we have the school district for? So uh, when I was, you know, I'm, I'm going a little bit. Oh wait, sorry, Ted, sorry? I, I'm yeah. supposed to read this for our radio audience. Um, this is City Club of Portland, uh, City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Rukaya Adams, Chief Investment Officer at Meyer Memorial Trust, and I'm here today with Ted Wheeler, Wheeler Mayor of Portland. Very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, the 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 question about how we intentionally engage youth. When I was the Multnomah County Chair about a decade ago, uh, then Mayor Tom Potter and I and others worked on a Youth Bill of Rights. And as that Youth Bill of Rights was being drafted by young people throughout our community, one of the things that they said that they needed in order to be heard and have uh, their opinions acted upon in local government was a Youth Commission. And so we created the Youth Commission, and the Youth Commission uh, is self-governing, it has support and help and administrative support from the city and the county, but it's actually a group of young people that set their own agenda, set their own objectives, and then they lobby and advocate for change in government, just the way the young woman Faith, who kicked off my State of the City speech, has been very active with peers all around the nation on uh, gun safety issues. And so that's one way we do it. Uh, I spend a lot of time with kids, even though yesterday was probably the busiest day I've ever had as the mayor of this city, I still made time to meet with three different groups of school kids who just came into City Hall as part of their tour. And I like to listen to them and I like to hear what their concerns are and I like to maybe demystify the office of mayor. They asked me, do I have a, you know, a mayoral plane? Uh, do I live in a mayoral mansion? Uh, and Do you? Uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> unfortunately, no. But um, your, your larger point is really accurate. We spend a lot of time as adults and as, as community leaders, and this room is full of some of the best you know, leadership in this community, thinking about the problems for, from our perspectives as adults, and we don't always think about the long term. I actually do. Uh, you, know, you, didn't, you, you said that we didn't mention infrastructure in the speech, and I'll be honest, I was a little behind, and so I flipped two pages ahead. Uh, but I wanna talk about why infrastructure investments are important. They're important because our generation, and I'm speaking broadly, and even the generation in front, you know, before us, they stopped investing in infrastructure. 
the way that prior generations had. And so we're seeing transportation infrastructure, parks infrastructure, civic infrastructure collapsing around us. And that weighs on my mind, because if we do nothing in this generation, you say, oh, the number's too big, there's nothing we can do about it, or we're waiting on Washington, D.C. to act, we are abdicating again and pushing that problem onto the next generation. And that's why we created the Build Portland program that creates $600 million of funding for infrastructure over 20 years to get at that backlog that's previously been ignored. But I could look at any number of areas where we are failing to keep up with the investments that were made for us by prior generations that we are not making on behalf of this generation that follows us. And it's everything from parks to civic infrastructure to transportation systems to schools to roads. We, we are not doing what we need to do to get to that objective I laid out, whereas on the last day of my life, I better be able to look my daughter in the eye and tell her I left this place in better shape than when I found it. So that, that failure to invest is a form of wealth transfer. We're taking mm -hmm. the wealth from the future and, and bringing it into the present and, and spending it. Um, and what concerns me, though, is that I, I, don't have a, I don't hear a coordinated plan for, for building a more wealthy, and I don't mean numerically or in <laughs> currency, but in lifestyle and quality of life, access to clean air, water a plan for the future in a coherent sense. Do you think that that kind of planning would reside in the mayor's office as uh, the connector between the county and the school districts and the various other parts of the region? Yeah, you know, we, we have very fragmented government here. Um, we have... No, no snaps to that? What? Yeah, we, we have you very guys fragmented... You are sleeping on the job. I, I still see the city's former planning director and the city's current chief administrative officer at least attempting to snap their fingers. <laughs> so I assume that's willful intent to participate in the conversation. Um, you know, we have Metro, we have the county, we have the city, we have the school districts, we have the state, we have a variety of quasi-independent commissions and jurisdictions. Uh, and it makes global planning difficult. But that doesn't give us an excuse not to do it. I want to put somebody else's vision on the table for a minute and compare it to our own. Uh, I, I don't mind criticizing myself and, and holding my own actions up to the light of day. Let's look at Los Angeles. Nobody thinks of Los Angeles as a paragon of planning, right? Um, yet, when they raise the question of how do we plan for the future of our community around transportation, they went big. There was this thing called Measure M, and it looked at everything from the work that we you know, call uh, safe routes to school, the work we call Vision Zero, uh, the work that we call community connectivity, uh, the work around uh, active transportation and linking bikeways and walkways and safety, the way we think about mass transit, they linked all of those things together. And rather than saying, oh, here's a package for the next three projects and calling it a day, they looked at how the entire community fits together around all of those issues. And they included questions about how does wealth get generated through the development of the projects who gains access to that prosperity? In other words, how do you spread the wealth to communities that have historically been either shut out or worse yet, negatively impacted by those developments? And how do we ensure that the people who are contracted and working on those programs actually come from those communities first? And what they ended up with was a $120 billion package over a 40-year period, so it's a multi-generational vision, with over 800 million coming in in just the first year. And this wasn't a bunch of government, one, one sec, Rukai, it wasn't just a bunch of government bureaucrats who did this, it was a broad community engagement process, and at the end of the day, the voters voted for it overwhelmingly. 
That's very, you know, we do bits and pieces of that through Prosper Portland on, on the, the contracting side. We, we pushed through the city council our, our community equity uh, and inclusion program around contracting and employment. Uh, we certainly uh, do a tremendous amount of outreach into the community, but we've never put together a big picture vision like that and worked with the community to build community support for it and ultimately have them own it. And I believe we need to do that in order to be a successful community in the future. Successful communities will be those that think big, that think visionary, and engage the community in helping to develop it and implement that vision. I agree. So was it the LA mayor that led that visioning? You know, it was a whole group of different people. Um, and it included the mayor, it included the county, uh, it included different planning agencies, it included uh, different constituencies in the communities. And what I was told uh, by, pe not the mayor directly, uh, but people on the mayor's staff who I asked about this, was they started smaller. And the larger the vision got, and the more inclusive the vision got, the higher the polling numbers were. Well, that's Isn't good. that interesting? That is interesting, and I hope that then you'll support the Albina visioning process that might turn into that for Portland. Um, good budget but, pitch right there. Did you see that? <laughs> This is why I like you, Rakaya. She got it in right there up front. Speaking of California leadership, um, in preparation for our conversation, I read about the California House Bill 931. So this series of questions comes to you as our police commissioner. Um, in that bill, they're aiming to change the lethal force standard through legislation. Um, this would, would change the, the, the standard from reasonable force to necessary force. One of the tensions in the state of the city speech for me yesterday was that Portlanders are saying, stop killing us, and that's a substantive culture and violence conversation about policing. And the comments you made were about operations, so resources, response time, and a few other things. And that just didn't sit well with me, so I wanted to circle back to it sure. and hear a little bit more about your vision for, one, addressing the substantive community issue about sanctioned violence, and two, whether or not you think this California approach, which is changing the legal standard, would be helpful in whatever that plan is that you have. Uh, so first of all, specifically with the legal standard in California, I don't know enough about that to give you an informed, intelligent opinion on it. It does raise a couple of questions in my mind. Yeah, Who gets to it. define necessary? So the question isn't whether what language we use. The question is, would you be open to a legislative change to the standard in order to help our police officers approach problems in a different way? That's the question. Uh, I would unequivocally say yes to that. Uh, but I wouldn't want it to be a standard that is created in the heat of the moment without really thinking through what the implications of that standard are. Uh, and you're right, yesterday I talked mostly about operational issues, but I think you cannot separate the operational issues and the actual circumstances of the police bureau from the cultural questions that we are currently asking about social justice, about equity, about de-escalation, and about implicit bias. Those things are all real. Um, but, and that's sort of me speaking as mayor, but I'm, I'm in this awkward position because I am probably the only person in America who is both the mayor and the police commissioner. And here's what I'm seeing is... So let, is, let, is there conflict me, in that? Th there is. And so let, let me connect the dots and then let me talk about what the conflict is from, from my perspective. Because I, I think you're, you're hitting on a really important point about conflict. Uh, the, the punchline is yes, I believe the two jobs are directly in conflict, and I, I will get to that, so hold that aside. Uh, first of all, with regard to the police, my concern at the moment is that we are not delivering on the basic promise 
that the police bureau exists to fulfill, and that is this. When you pick up the phone and you call 911 for the police, you expect somebody to show up, and you expect them to show up on a timely basis, you expect them to be professional, you expect them to be well-rested and thoughtful and in a good state of mind, but here's the facts. We actually have fewer police officers today than we did 10 years ago. We have hundreds fewer than we did in the 1990s, yet our population has blossomed. The number of calls to 911 has actually gone up about 25% just in the last five years, and the time to response is increasing precipitously. And in certain types of crime categories, homicides, uh, uh, sexual assaults, uh, battery, property crimes, uh, traffic fatalities, hit and runs, in all of those categories, crime is actually increasing, yet we don't have the number of police officers to be able to respond in a timely basis. President Obama put forward a national program called 21st Century Policing, which I adhere to. Uh, it includes as the cornerstone this idea of community policing which is the opposite of having police in cars driving down the street. It's getting people out of their cars, connecting them to people all throughout the community, engaging them with the shop owners, the people on the streets, going to neighborhood association and community meetings, and building trust with the community and, and sharing with the community. We can't do that if we don't have enough police officers to even fulfill their legal obligations to respond to 911 calls. We have to end the killing, and the way to do it is training, and we are, you know, all of our officers start their implicit bias training, chief, it's next month, right? Next month, uh, we constantly uh, train on the theme of de-escalation, and uh, I need to recruit new young people into the Bureau, and I don't mean this is an ageist statement, but I've got a lot of people retiring who have viewed policing in one way and they've been trained in one way and they have worked in one way and they've served uh, their time as police officers, men and women, but now we're bringing in young people who represent the types of values that you put on the table. They want to come in and be part of community policing. They want to be helpful. They want to be problem solvers. Mayor Wheeler, I think most Portlanders appreciate that. We want a, a well, uh, funded and well-trained police force. We, we want them to be safe in their work. Where there's a mismatch in the conversation is that more police officers will not change the sense that there isn't a lack of accountability, I mean that there is a lack of accountability. More police officers will not change a culture of violence that's institutional in, implicit bias training for individuals will not undo the institutional biases. So the rub is, how do we walk this path toward transformation, recruiting new police officers, supporting our police officers, having a tone of openness for change there, yet for many of us, feeling like we don't, we don't see a resource problem. Certainly the man who, who passed this week there were eight officers there, right? And that other people are not seeing that the biggest problem isn't the amount of time that they have to wait, it's that they're afraid of violence and, and, and the community's torn apart by a lack of accountability. So how can we walk those two paths? So that question is to you as the police commissioner, how do you envision us walking that path together? Yeah, and, and this is where, and this, I'll, I'll do a twofer here, because oh, I'll wait, I'll I'm else... being reminded again, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. It'll give you some time to think about that answer. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Rukaya Adams, Chief Investment Officer at Meyer Memorial Trust, and I'm here today with Ted Wheeler, Mayor of Portland. So I'll connect those two issues. Are, are you looking at your watch because you're bored, or are we out of time? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you know, Rukaya asked the question about the conflict, and I think she is perfectly honed in on the conflict. So. I don't dispute anything you just said about changing the culture. It is, at the end of the day, about a transformation of the police bureau. I mean, heck, policing nationally is going through a transformation. It's going through a transformation here, too. 
and it's a difficult transition. I mean, I, I alluded to this a little bit in my speech yesterday about how when we did the search for a new police chief, we engaged the community. Uh, we had focus groups, we had surveys, uh, and I put very explicitly in the job posting that the next police chief has to have an understanding of and appreciation how the institutional racism and the racism in our community, which is historically just a fact, impacts policing today. And I brought in a police chief, Chief Outlaw, um, to help me engage in that particular way. The conflict comes like this. There is accountability. There are now two investigations, plus a grand jury will be assembled with regard to the incident that you just mentioned. Yet already this week, uh, it's been suggested that I be shot. My life has been threatened. My family has been threatened. Um, I have been protested. I have stood by while I watch people say things on internet that I think will ultimately possibly prove to be completely false. And what I've asked for is for people to please wait until the facts are out. But people have already concluded that this particular incident is one more example of fill in the blank. And we don't know that yet. The tough, and that, the wait, tough I'm thing getting, about on, waiting, on, though, Ted, on, is that on. we've been waiting for hundreds of years. I, I right? understand, but That's I haven't been around for hundreds of years. I've been mayor for 15 months, and I'm going to do everything I can to make this police force accountable and responsive to the needs of this community. And I'm telling you, by engaging in a full community policing model, I mean, maybe you've changed your mind, but I talked about this a lot during my campaign, and you elected me on the premise that I would move us towards a 21st century policing model, a full community policing model, that we would train our officers in implicit bias, that we would focus on de-escalation strategies, that we would reconnect and rebuild that trust with the community. You elected me to do that, and that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, so my takeaway here is that you have the vision of transforming the police force, that resources are a part of that vision, that you're open to changing the standards and approaches using legislative changes. So I hope there are legislators in the room. And that that's a top priority for you as mayor. When I uh, ran, I was asked, I think it was Willamette Week, but I, I don't remember explicitly or specifically which bureau was the most in need of reform. Um, and by the way, the, that's before I, I saw what was going on in some of the other bureaus. Um, <laughs> I said the police bureau, and that wasn't a slam at the, the, the men and women in our police bureau. There are many fine men and women in our police bureau, and I, th I happen to think I have the best police chief in the United States of America. I actually believe that. I think we, um, all, we all agree. A plus, and, a plus on that and one. And so the, the question really then becomes how do we, you're, you're absolutely right, Rukaya, when you say that there is long-standing institutional racism and a long-standing history of the police being used to, um, I can't think of the right word exactly, but, but you know, really to bedevil our communities of color and uh, not being used for the benefit of the entire community. I'm talking historically over many, many years. And so here we are in rapid, real time, trying to fix that culture. Cultural shifts, unfortunately, they don't happen in one legislative session. You can legislate whatever you want, but really changing the culture and bringing in the people who share our values around community policing and taking the time and the resources to train them appropriately so they respond in the ways that we want them to respond as a community and to imbue our community values that can't be legislated. That's a process that has to be led through example no, it, over a period of years. it can't be legislated, but it can start with legislation. And what would also help to get people on board for the long walk toward transformation is clarity about a vision. And that is what we're missing, clarity that we have a sense of togetherness and a commitment to move in that direction. It feels to me like there isn't that clarity. 
And for better or worse, as our relatively new mayor, we need that from you. We need that from our police commissioner. So can we circle back to that police commissioner mayor thing? Sure. So try to give me in one sentence, Ted, why those are sometimes in tension and conflict. Help us understand that. Being mayor uh, is a multifaceted job, and it's a great job, actually, being mayor. Being mayor is a little bit cheerleader for the city. Uh, being mayor is setting a large vision for the community, and uh, we've talked a little bit about vision in the past. Uh, being mayor is about setting an example. Being mayor is being the one who responds. You know, in our form of government, my colleagues have exactly as much authority as I do, but the public expects me to respond to issues and be there in times of need. Um, being police commissioner is a completely different proposition. Being police commissioner is working with the police chief and others to actually make sure that our bureau is effective, that it is accountable, that it is resourced, and that it is trained. So I get into these awkward situations like this uh, where I am both speaking in terms of operations, and I hear you saying, but I want you to talk about the vision, and I want you to talk about the values. And sometimes those things can be in conflict. For example, and I, I won't get into the details because I think it's irresponsible for me to do so, but the officer involved shooting. People are out in front of my office with signs saying, why aren't you speaking out on this? Why aren't you telling us more? instead of just saying, wait till the facts come out? And the answer is, because I'm the police commissioner and I have an obligation to the integrity of those investigations as well as setting the vision for the city. So sometimes there is that conflict. So what's an alternative model? Anything but. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sort of serious about that. Um, so, you know, the, we're, we're, a big, we're a big city, we're grown up now. And uh, we have a larger and more diverse population, and um, y y I I'll, I'll go to the, the thrust that you, I think, have appropriately set up for this conversation. Why do you think we have this model? It's unique. Why do you think we have it? And I'll give you a hint. How many people of color have served on the Portland City C Council? And that is why there is so much and, pressure on you right now. The yeah. system is designed to have a small, relatively small group of people mm -hmm. control city council positions, and if the mayor being among them is always the police commissioner, then there are two layers of institutional exactly. filters that prevent change from happening, exactly. which is why there's a, like a, a flow of pressure coming your way. So either, the community changes its form of government, or we think about the role of police commissioner as being distinct from the role of mayor. Yes, or ordinarily a mayor would be in a position of holding a police commissioner accountable. We don't have that here. Do you have that conversation in your head sometimes? <laughs> You don't, you don't want to know what conversations I have in my head, Rukai. <laughs> So you see there are these layers upon layers that make change difficult, and it makes it very difficult for Portlanders, Portlanders of color to hear you say, let's just wait and see what happens. Why don't you hold off? Because that sounds to mm -hmm. us like the institutional wet blanket to change. And, yeah, and I, I, I don't it. disagree with that at all. Uh, you know, I, I wish I could sit here today and tell you everything I know, but if I do that, um, I will be absolutely hammered tomorrow by those conducting investigate, and there, there were a lot of witnesses, there were a lot of so, interviews. So could That's we hire a, a police commissioner that would, be, would not be on the council? In this form of government, people will still come to me as the police commissioner. You cannot take the role of a commissioner and give it to somebody outside of the council under the city charter. So will you come back for a separate conversation about the form of government? I'd be delighted. Okay. Lots of snapping, clapping, people like that one. My bureau directors don't like that. I don't know why not. Tom does. I okay, think I good. just saw the chief say that she'd be open to that conversation. 
All right. Okay, I think, <laughs> how are we doing on time? Okay, we're transitioning to q and I'm sorry to the audience, we didn't get to the discussion about affordable housing, which I plan to say, hey, awesome job on the 6,000 units, but there are hundreds of thousands of people who need help, so could, could, let's- Could, I, could let's, I take one minute and just respond to that? Yeah. Could I please? Because somebody will probably ask me about it. So, in terms of affordability, the year before I got to the city council, the Housing Bureau created 300 units of affordable housing. My first year, it was 600 units. This year will be 700 units. 2019 will be a five-fold increase to 1,300 units. You pass the housing bond, that will create at least 1,300 units. The time frame was five to seven years. We're already, you know, we're only 18 months into this. We've already got half of that locked down. If you pass the, con here's my pitch for the day. If you pass the constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot in November, I can take that 1,300 units and double or triple it. So I hope we'll have a separate conversation later, closer to the election, on the constitutional amendment. That's awesome. So in preparation for the dis this discussion about housing, I went back and read Gretchen Kafori's platform for city council, and she ran on a housing platform. What she had to say 30, 40 years ago was almost perfectly apt for today. So I would encourage folks to go back and look at what she had to say. And then we went back to the formation of the Portland Housing Bureau after the Kaiser shipbuilding industry took off and there was a lack of affordable housing for workers. We had the same conversation at that time. So this is a cyclical conversation where we underfund housing for working people. It's a workforce issue. We've got to deal with it. And the interesting thing is that you are such an engaged mayor. I also want to say to you that this has happened in Portland before, that we have always needed workers and we've always under, you know, underproduced affordable housing. So let's cut it out already <laughs> and do it. So we, we now have uh, this year more permits and units in production than we have at any time in the last 15 years. And we produced this year more affordable housing units at all levels than we ever have in any single year in the history of this city. But I agree with you. Uh, Rukaya is putting out the challenge, how are we going to light this on fire and make a bigger splash? Number one, let's get the private sector unleashed, and we're doing that with our pilot permitting process to make it easier, faster, and less expensive to permit housing projects. We're doing it with the multi that I pushed through the city council the other day, and the county commissioners are looking at that. I hope they'll support it. The central 30, 30 20, 35 plan, uh, that also will expand the opportunity for all levels of affordability, potentially to the tune of thousands and thousands of units of affordable housing. So there's no one magic solution here. It's a package of structural changes to the way we do things. Um, so uh, you may not agree with the results, but I agree with the premise of what you put on the table. And I, I believe we're I don't doing disagree that. with the results. I think people just want to, to be clear about the scale of the problem and the people that it's impacting, that children are bearing the brunt of that lack of housing affordability and that we're, we need to get on it. So it wasn't a disagreement, it was to really shine a bright light on what yeah, the big I, plan is. I, I don't disagree at all. I mean, there, if you want to help kids, you know, people ask me, they say, well, you're the mayor, you don't have anything to do with education. I say, are you kidding me? Uh, housing and educational achievement uh, they're linked in a really important way because the constant displacement of young people, as, as you, you know this, Rukaya, so I'm, I'm not telling you this, but as they chase housing affordability and they move from school to school or school district to school district, that impacts right. their academic achievement. Let's now go to the audience for some questions. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for the staff to collect. You can also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. To City Club members who would like to ask a question at the microphone, please identify yourself as a member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. 
Wynne Wakala, City Club member. I had the honor of working with the Portland Police, and I know like everywhere else, there's some good guys and there's some bad guys, but most of the people I know worked for police because they wanted to serve their community. Anyway, back in the 80s, Reagan closed down a lot of the mental health facilities, and I know now the police are having to deal with things they never used to have to deal with. How can we work with the county in helping the mental health issues so the police are not counselors? So this is a, well, first of all, let, let me be very clear. I have long believed that here in the United States of America, we're the embarrassment of the industrialized world when it comes to community-based mental health services. We have not acknowledged the scope of the problem, nor have we invested in it. Here in Oregon, we've created our own problems. We had a centralized system in Salem. We decentralized it to the community, but when that happened, there were no funds that followed into the community. And so the folks that we're seeing on the streets, a lot of them are struggling with very serious mental health issues. And at the edges, I think we've made some good improvements. On the policing side, we've, we've created the behavioral health unit. Uh, on the county and city side, we've partnered with the Unity Center. Uh, but we, we need a Marshall-esque type intervention at all levels of government to acknowledge both addiction which continues to grow at an alarming rate nationally, and mental health services, which continue to grow in need at an alarming rate nationally and locally. Uh, at the city, we're doing everything we can. As I said, my, my first dollars into this budget this year are going to go into the Joint Office of Homeless Services. And a big part of that is connecting people with whatever services they need to get off and stay off the street. And a big part of that is funding the county's mental health interventions. Uh, Bill Dickey, City Club member. Hi, Bill. I'm uh, feeling slightly marginalized because I'm not a finger snapper. Uh, you know, was, you my, can learn, Bill. You can learn. I have confidence in you. The other issue I, I have is with uh, the city government. The reason we have the city government we have today is because the citizens of Portland voted down the alternative about 12 years ago. That's, that's my question. Your question stands on its own merit, sir. <laughs> My name is Ann Barkley, and I'm a City Club a member. Hi, Ann. Uh, in late March, Mr. Mayor, you and 10 other city mayors um, prepared an op-ed that was published in U.S. Today, uh, objecting to state preemption of gun laws. Yes. You said that cities ought to be able to pass gun safety laws when necessary. My question to you is, will you seek and support legislation in Oregon's two, um, 2020 legislative session to eliminate the preemption in Oregon? I absolutely would. And I'll tell you, there are 43 other states, Anne, where this is the case. And I'm going to be very frank with you, the NRA has tremendous sway in this state as it does in every other state to make sure that municipal governments, particularly large urban governments, do not have the tools they need to be able to make the changes we need to make. At the federal level, people overwhelmingly support common sense gun legislation, and here in Portland, it's hugely overwhelmingly supported, and yet our hands are tied by state preemptions. I want the ability to do what we need to do to live up to our values here locally, and so yes, I would support that. Hello, my Hi. name is Cynthia Harris, and I have served on the NAACP, and I've served with Antoinette on the Collaborative Peace Collaborative. We're concerned that Chief Outlaw have the best support for being successful. So we're excited about her spirit and her energy, and we're glad she's here. She's from my hometown. And uh, we want to know, uh, I can't finger snap either, but we want to know what kind of uh, supports are you giving her? And I want to compliment you for the process. I did participate in that process. Thank you. I appreciate that. I can do peace signs. I can't snap. But um, So I just want one or two strategies that you plan to make sure that she's successful. So 
The first part is to partner with her. I, I have been around Portland uh, long enough to see how things go badly when the mayor and the police chief don't get along, don't communicate, don't collaborate, don't talk about their unified strategy, don't go to the city council and sell their collective vision. Uh, the chief and I, there is absolutely zero space between our vision or values around 21st century community policing and training. And I will, you know, I, I told her, but you know, she asked me this question, Cynthia, when, before she accepted the job, she asked me the question, are you going to support me in this new community, in this new police bureau, as a woman of color? Are you going to be there for me? And I will tell you what I told her. I said, our futures are connected. If she fails here, I fail here. If she succeeds here, I succeed here. And uh, I didn't remove, effectively, a well-liked, successful police chief to replace him with somebody else just to see her walked off the glass cliff. That's not going to happen here. She has my complete support, my complete trust, and you're all hearing it today. That's not going to change. Chief Outlaw, it sounds like you have a ride or die homie. That's good. Question from the That doesn't mean a raise, Chief, just to be <laughs> very. <laughs> uh, one question from the cards. Mayor Wheeler, what surprised you most when you became mayor? Oh my gosh. Um, what surprised me most? Um, I still haven't thought of the answer. <laughs> uh, what surprised me the most? Um, I'd have to say what surprised me the most was how hard the job actually is. It's much harder than I expected it to be. It's much more taxing than I expected it to be. The problems are much deeper than I expected them to be. And I'm not just talking about administrative problems in bureaus. I'm talking about where we are as a society and what it's like to lead in a time where people just don't trust government. The minute I got elected, I became like the least popular person in this city overnight. It was really weird. <laughs> And yet, I want you to know this, because I get asked like 10 times a day. I, I think Rukai even asked me this recently. It's like, are you all right? <laughs> How are you doing? Um, and I'm thinking, oh my god, am I walking around in Kleenex boxes or something? What have I done today? Well, you're saying and, that being mayor is like having your skin burned off. Yeah, it is. It's like having your skin burned off with a blowtorch uh, every single day. But I want you to know this. Uh, I love this city. I trust all of you. You have been more engaging. I've asked you to engage in many ways, and you have answered the call. I feel very energized by the job I do. I get up super early. I go to bed super late. I love the work I do. I wouldn't call it fun, but it is extremely meaningful. And going all the way back to Rukaya's very first question, if we do not succeed together as a community, it's not just us that we are failing. We are failing the people who come after us. And they're going to remember how we left the platform from which they get to grow and develop their community. And so I see this as, there is nothing I've ever done that's more meaningful in my life. But it did surprise me how incredibly challenging this job is. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done by far. Okay. <laughs> One more question. Good morning. morning. My name is Laura Sharp. I am a CD Club member. I'm also a Multnomah County Chair. I'm sorry, Multnomah County candidate for Multnomah County Chair. My question for you is, uh, in yesterday's State of the City address, uh, you referenced to the St. George City and that you would go to jail. You know, I too embrace immigrants. I've been a voice for immigrants, and I have stood up for the immigrants. Uh, I talk with several community African Americans 
And we were wondering, since me too, I too, us too sing America, where do we stand in the equation? Those of us who have scrubbed the floors, uh, taken care of the children, made sure we got in our houses before sundown, went to the back of the bus, where do we stand in Portland's equation as far as being represented and not being um, and equally treated? Where do we stand? Thank you, Deborah, and uh, it's great to see you again. Um, and people don't know this, Deborah made what I thought was a very passionate plea during our mayoral campaign for district representation. And I'm gonna play on that theme in answering your question. The best way that young people of color can be supported from my perspective, other than you know, the economic issues, the education, the housing issues we've been talking about, is to have credible visions of what they could be someday. The city council we have today is not at all diverse with regard to race. So when young kids come, I told you, you had three school groups yesterday, um, mostly kids of color, and they're looking at me, and I'm the mayor. And I'm not a bad guy, but they're looking at me, and they're not saying, oh, I could be like him someday. They're asking me if I get to fly around in a jet, the mayoral jet. And what they need to see, Deborah, is more people like you and more people like Rukaya so that they have that vision of what they could be. And with the current construct, it's harder for that vision to be true. So I try to make sure that when I think about who leads in my organization, on my staff, my bureau directors, the people who sit around the table where money is actually distributed, I think about who I want sitting around that table. And Deborah, I have always put community first, always. With that question, we have to wind down the conversation with the mayor. Please, everyone, join me in thanking Mayor Wheeler for this conversation. And thank, let's thank Rukaya Adams, please, as well. Rukaya. Thank you. Our time is up, and we need to pause the discussion for now, but we hope this is the beginning of even more in-depth conversation. Please join me one last time in saying a special thank you to Lisa Collins and Andrew Kollek, the producers of today's program.